And for my first Monster Train Expert Guide post DLC, we got some spell chain action to go over. If you're pretty good with spell chain, you might not learn a lot from this, so just forewarning. But for people that really haven't been finding much value out of it and whatnot, uh, I will tell you, I think by far, in a general sense, you know, we're broadly speaking here, but of the six available Divine Temple spell upgrades, I by far find spell chain consistently the best. But it took me a little bit to, to get there. Um, you know, the other ones are pretty straightforward. Spell chain isn't necessarily so straightforward. Uh, so what I'm going to give you is some general guidelines for what to, what to look for, what cards generally work well with a spell chain, what upgrades you want to combo with them. And then I'm also going to give you some specific cards that I think are pretty much bread and butter spell chain targets, as in you can almost always find pretty good value from putting a spell chain on them. And uh, yeah, let's get right into it here. There's going to be chapter markers. This one's not going to have as many chapters as my typical guides. But uh, yeah, general uses. So um, first thing, probably the most obvious thing is it's kind of a makeshift double stack. You know, any card that likes to be double stacked probably likes to be spell chained as well. Uh, only caveat there is if it's a naturally expensive card it's a bit worse with spell chain compared to double stack so say it's something like a ritual of battle which is already a three cost you know double stack only increases its cost up to four whereas a spell chain increases that cost to a seven essentially so not good in those type of cases but if it's like a one or a zero cost um it's essentially the same you could argue it's you could argue spell chains better even in those cases because you have the flexibility to play it on two different units, two different floors, whatever the spell is. So think of like, say, um, like an alloy, the one ember cost hellhorn card that just gives twenty five armor to somebody. If you were to you know typically you might. Uh, Amber reduce it by one, so it's down to zero, then double stack it back to one just to get 50. Well, with a spell chain, if you did that same thing, except instead of the double stack, you do a spell chain, still costs the same, still costs one ember at the end of the day. But instead of putting all 50 armor on one unit, you can split it up. So just little things here and there that kind of give spell chain the edge in a lot of cases. But again, you generally almost always with spell chain want to be reducing the ember with either the minus one or the minus two um, ember cost. Also worth noting, I didn't really note it here, but if you have a one cost and you put the minus two ember on it, your spell chained card that comes out will be a zero. It, it does take into factor that minus two and doesn't just sort of treat it as a minus one, even though it initially costed one. Anyway, um, as long as, uh, you know, and, and also worth noting is, you know, the double stack upgrade, it only works for effects, essentially. It doesn't work for flat stat increases, but spell chain does. So take like a Wicklash, for example. If you double stack a Wicklash, all you're getting is four burnout versus two burnout. But with the spell chain, you're still getting the four burnout, but you're getting 20 damage instead of 10 damage. So for any sort of flat stat increase spell chain is pretty nice it's also a, make a makeshift hell vent um, what I mean by that is sometimes you might just want the card to uh, basically copy it and then cycle back into it again uh, assuming you can't play it that same turn this would be usually for like a more expensive card so something like an adaptive mutation let's say it just you didn't put any upgrades it's a two cost but you generally have a game plan to do adaptive mutation twice well instead of hell venting your adaptive mutation you could just spell chain it play the first one when you need to then cycle back through your deck or you know if you have a, a permafrost on it uh, you know the version that comes out will be permafrosted and it'll just be sitting there for when you want to have your follow-up adaptive mutation so you know makeshift hell vent also works so anything any sort of like tech card like a Dappy Mutation or maybe a Last Stand, something like that, you could definitely get some use out of that. And then also, Incant and Infusion, or just Echo builds in general, will love any cheap 
reusable spell here. It almost doesn't matter what it is. So like in an incant build, uh, you know, in my earlier incant uh, videos, I've kind of outlined the gold standards for good incant cards. And generally the gold standard really is just that it's a zero cost and that it doesn't need any enemy target. You know, it's either an AOE or something you can play on your own guys or just something that can be played on the floor without any prerequisites. Um, and if it's a good card, all the better, but it doesn't even need to be a good card. It just needs to be that. So similar here, anything like that, adding a spell chain to it makes that incant build even better because you're getting two incants for the, for the draw cost of one. And even better if that card has some card draw in it because then you're even like an increasing your draw therefore like uh you know spoiler alert but offering token will be one of my cards that i outline like using offering token as an example you now really start cycling through the deck you see a lot more cards you can just get a lot more incants and if you spell chain it you get those extra incants the extra draws extra discards extra offerings it's just very very nice um similarly with infusion you know just any old infused cheap card uh you'll get two infusions out of it which is pretty good i mean that's you, you're almost getting like a discounted bounding echoes at that point for for the purposes of what you might get from a typical bounding echoes and then uh you know similar to the hell vent but permafrost does also make for a makeshift holdover so if you couldn't really find holdover it's getting down to the wire you really need to like holdover card but you find permafrost and you have a slot available, you could add spell chain. And it's essentially could be kind of like a holdover in that sense. You know, you play it, it's in your hand for the next turn. This is this is for a card you'd want to maybe be playing once a turn, not necessarily spamming out twice on a turn. So say even like uh hmm uh I don't know, just some sort of like uh heal, for example, like uh unleash the wildwood. You know, if you couldn't find holdover, but you really want to be healing almost every turn, you could play it once. There's not really any advantage to playing it again on the same turn, but if it's permafrosted and you create a copy of it, you'll then have that for the next turn, or maybe even two turns from now, you know, however much buffer room you have for your health, and then eventually cycle back, you'll cycle back into it. You could almost argue it's better than a holdover in that sense, because you don't have to force yourself to keep drawing it over and over again when you might not necessarily need it every turn. And I mentioned it earlier, but you generally don't. You want either the shell, so you want the spell to already be cheap, or if it's not already cheap, you want to ember reduce it. Generally, you want to get them down to a zero cost if you can help it. One can work, but remember, even at a one, it's now a three cost. At a zero cost, it's just a one cost. That's a pretty big difference. So really, you want to try to get your spell chained cards down to zero, uh, unless you have a specific reason not to. And a few common mistakes I think a lot of people make with spell chain is the first is just spell chaining a high cost card without a real good reason to do so. You know, spell chaining a high cost card itself isn't necessarily a misplay, but if you're just doing it to do it without much thought of what that's bringing your deck, you're most likely actually lowering the value of your deck every time you play that spell chained card. So we had talked about like Ritual of Battle before, how it's not necessarily going to be a great uh, spell chain target without a minus two Ember upgrade. Um, I'd argue even then it's not necessarily the best spell chain target, but uh, you know at a, at a three, even a two cost, if you just get one Ember upgrade on it and at a two cost, that's still five. Like to play it on the same turn would be five Ember. That's pretty tough, so essentially all you're doing is cycling in more expensive ritual battles into your deck. You'd be better off, honestly, just sticking with, uh, in that case, I would say just get the ritual down to one cost, put put two one ember upgrades into it, if you couldn't find a minus two ember upgrade, and just do that. Don't spell chain it. Cycle back into it, play it for a cheap amount, get good value out of it. Now there's, of course, artifacts can change that. You know, artifacts always change. Like, like Volatile Gauge can totally change that. Split Anvil can change that. And just, like, like say you got a held over tomb with the artifact that gives five ember when your tombs die. That's in the, At that point, you're like, ah, I got enough ember, I can do something like that, right? So obviously, this isn't always going to be the case. But in the cases outside of those, you generally just don't want to be creating cards you can't play on your turn uh, just to, like, 
see another copy of them. You know, this this kind of goes against, if we go back to the last slide, it kind of goes against this makeshift hell vent point, but it's like a makeshift, the makeshift hell vent is makeshift. And in a lot of ways, you don't necessarily always want to do it, right? So that's a, uh, probably the, actually the number one mistake, I'd say. Uh, and then the other one would just be slapping spell chain on a card just because you want to use the upgrade. You, see, you know, this, this is almost like when you see, see multi-strike in a shop and you're like, ah, oh, crap, I saw multi-strike and I have no unit that it really makes sense on, right? Uh, and then it would obviously be a mistake to just spend the resources on it. Very similar with spell chain, because once you start to like spell chain, you can fall into the trap of like, ah, I gotta spell chain something. There's too much value getting left on the floor, right? But that's not gonna be good. Um, you know, like it's similar to this, even if it's a cheap card, but it doesn't really make sense to do it. Um, and I said out, outside of incant and infusion, because as we've outlay, as we've already outlined, incant and infusion can actually totally get away with this. You can do it just because you want to use upgrade with an incant infusion, because it's just nice to have extra infusions and extra incants out of a single card, right? But outside of that. You shouldn't just do it just to do it. So example would be like spell chaining grovel when you don't really have a reason for those extra morsels. Like if you had a reason, by all means do it. But if you're like, oh, grovel, I'll, I'll spell chain it because that can be like some okay value. Not really. Even if you bring it down to one costs to play both in the same turn, that's three ember. The morsels could become a liability if you really don't have a, a use for them. You know, you might have to either... Uh, put them on a floor that triggers slays or harvests for the enemy or alternatively you might just have to hold them and then they're cycling back into your hands um, also if you're not really in need of those damage shields it's still you're you're now going to have to play the purged you know the, the purged version of gravel that it creates you're going to have to spend a lot of ember on it just to basically purge it out of your deck or you're going to recycle into cards that you just don't want so that's really the mistakes. You don't want to start, you could boil all of this down to like, don't get yourself in a situation where you're essentially shuffling scourges into your deck. Um, you know, scourges that don't damage you, which there is a scourge that does that. If you know ring two, we all know ring two, there's a scourge that does that. So you're essentially playing the role of uh, the little dudes that shuffle all those scourges into your deck. Yeah, don't do that. Now we're going to get to the meat of this, the bread and butter section. Uh, the, rem the remainder, I can talk, remainder of this guide, carry the one, covers my personal favorite targets for spell chain in the sense that they meet the following criteria. So they're, they're almost always going to be good. Uh, they don't require specific synergies, supporting cards, you know, spells or units. They don't require any of this to shine. They're almost just always going to be a good target. And um, on top of that, this, if they do have additional supporting elements, uh, or sorry, the, the, uh, if they do need some sort of supporting elements, because some of these in this list do, the likelihood of those supporting elements existing within the clan are extremely high. Uh, the first one on this list will be a good example of this, but we'll get to that in a minute here. And in a similar sense, they don't require rare spell upgrades to be found. And what I mean by rare is like, you know, a minus one ember upgrade is always available. That's not rare. But a double stack, that's going to be rare. That's same likelihood as finding like a multi-strike. So you're not, you may not find it in a run. And like the Divine Temple upgrades as well, you may not find a minus two Ember upgrade on a run or a spell chain for that matter. But, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't want any of the main featured cards on this list to have those type of requirements. So minus one Ember is pretty much going to be universal on any of them that don't already cost zero. But that's fine because every single spell shop, you'll find it. You'll find it twice if you want to reroll and it only costs 25 gold each time. And then last but not least, there has to be a good amount of value generated by spell chaining these cards. Um, also such that if you found it early game, you could still just lock in the spell chain if you see it, and it'll still be worth it. 
And that may, in fringe cases, not apply to some of these, but I think that's just a general goal I had in mind with these. Uh, I didn't want you to feel that your spell chain went to waste. So the first one on this list, I don't know what happened to the resolution there, but um, <laughs> that's a very yellow picture. I don't know what that, what's going on there. Anyway, Broken Memories. This is my number one favorite of in the entire game. It's almost... E even though it does technically require some synergies in that you need a consumed card to combo it with, in Wormkin alone, let's not even factor in your secondary clan, but in Wormkin alone there's so many consumables, and even if there aren't, there's cards that apply consume to any card. You're going to find a consumable, and even if it's not that great of a consumable, this is still a super high value spell chain. And if it is a high value consumable, GG. You have most likely won the game. So the idea here is that you play a consumable, of course, to get it into your consume pile, and then you play the spell chained broken memories and bring it back. And then you use the the purged version that gets created of broken memories to bring the broken memories back. So and then remember this puts it on the top of your draw pile, so you will draw both those cards next turn. Or if you have draw cards the same turn, you'll draw them that turn, and you can set up an infinite. But that's... I didn't really factor infinites in here. That's a whole separate thing I have planned for another time. But outside of infinites, this is still incredibly powerful. You essentially... Think about the reason a consumable card is usually a consumable card. It's usually a consumable because it's too powerful uh, to just be allowed to recycle in your deck, right? It's too powerful to just slap a hold over on it. They want you to spend a bunch of gold to find Eternal Stone, which then also increases the ember of it, and then, uh, only then is it even recyclable into your deck, not to mention Holdover. Holdover is another hundred-some gold upgrade you'd put on it to get that. Well, you're achieving that already with Broken Memories. You're achieving 200-ish plus gold upgrades just by spell chaining this. And it only costs you an ember to do this. You could as, you could also argue it costs you two draws, but you're drawing the thing you want, so I don't really even factor that in necessarily. But for the record, you will draw. You'll you'll once you get this chain set up, you will dig through your deck a little a little more slowly. So that is something you might want to factor in. But anyway, I would have to imagine most of the time these were the cards you were digging for anyway. Uh, so. You know, and like I said, uh, bonus points. Well, well, let's well, let's get into these. So, um, you know, bonus points is uh, if broken memories is infused, or if the consumable you're returning is infused. Extra bonus points if both of them are infused. If if they're all infused, that's three minimum infusions you're getting each turn just from this combo. And that's pretty good. You have any sort of inspire going on, or just any need of echoes, any synergy with echoes, that's a good deal. Also, bonus points for etch, uh, either artifacts and or the units. Um, say you have a first of kin who gets five damage per etch, ten if you if you infuse it into itself, which I often like to do. That is a bare minimum plus 20 damage in that case. If you, uh, It's either 10, 10 if you don't have the infusion, 20 if you do have the kin, uh, first of kin infused into itself. You'll get 20 bare minimum because you get the broken memories, which is a consume, the returned card, which is a consumed, and then any other consumes, of course, but that's still a guaranteed 20 damage a turn. That's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good deal. Plus, you got all the other etch type things. Like if you got a martial lord with a bunch of, you know, let's say the big boy bog egg, bog cocoon eggs that have 12, 12 uh, stacks of of shell to hatch. Well, you'll you'll do it pretty fast with, with this. Um, and then, I, you know, as I mentioned, uh, super bonus points. This should read super mega ultra, you know, 999999 bonus points if the consumable card being returned has pretty high value. So, Think like Last Stand, that's the card that doubles your whole entire floor's rage. You know, you can return that every single turn. That's insane. Hell, you could you could hell vent 
you know, maybe you get lucky and you can help out both of them, then you're getting it twice a turn. Or even beyond that, let's say Hellvent this, or you spell chain this, you spell chain the last stand, you got the Ember to make it work, that even then you're getting two last stands every turn. It's insane. But even just some normal, like even like a Wildwood Sap can be okay, right? Like that, a Wildwood Sap's a more like tamed down version, but even then you're still getting your etches, you're getting your inspires, you're getting a bunch of regen. Uh, a lot of good stuff there. Broken Memories is kind of broken, shall we say, with Spell Chained. Then Space Prism, not nearly enough to talk about with this one, not that it's not equally as great, but it's just a pretty straightforward one. It's for the low price of one Ember, because it costs zero, the Spell chain version comes out, it's one, you increase the floor by two. And you could even spread it out if you wanted to, if, if that makes sense with your build, but, you know, in the context of a single floor setup, like, you know, a lot of times you just have a single floor that you care about. And that's basically equivalent to both your flying boss upgrades. Like, it's essentially equivalent to that, just out of one card. And extra bonus points if you can intrinsic it on top of that. Then you're just guaranteed the two pip. Right off the bat, you can game plan your banner units around that. Maybe you can just slap down a large stone upgrade or some infusion that increases pip, like an alpha fiend or something high value like that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, what else is there to say about this one? It's just really good. It's always going to be good. And Perils, this one's just very, um, very solid, even if you're not doing an Ember Drain build. So you got to think it's for a very low price, you know, shall we say, negative five Ember, <laughs> essentially. Um, you get six Rage, and that's pretty good. Uh, but mainly, you know, beyond it, it's good for scaling. It's but it's also just really good, mainly for the ember. But it's not, you know, six rage is nothing you can ignore. That's still pretty good too. But, um, you know, we I have an ember drain build uh, guide that you could probably reference. But um, this just makes that even better. You're guaranteed five ember a turn. You know, talking about space prism. Similarly, this is a that's the equivalent to a flying boss level of ember and that's assuming that you're stacking ember drain on a, a persistent unit you know if you're just putting it you don't have to do that you can put it on like temporary units like morsels or like tombs stuff like that then you're getting like you know five plus however much ember you already had and that's a lot of ember if you got some good x cost cards to combo that with you can do some pretty insane stuff so it's like I find this card has pretty good floor, insane ceiling with the spell chain. It also, you know, in that sense, you also don't have to just go all in on an Ember Drain build for this spell chained card to find value. You know, you have the flexibility of making it just be your scaling and r guaranteeing five Ember a turn. It's not even really an Ember Drain build at that point, but you'll be glad if you found Furnace Tap, and you'll be gl glad if you found Void Binding, of course. But you don't even need it for that to be good value, like putting that with Holdover, for example. And I realize Holdover is a rare upgrade that I talked about, but I guess what I'm saying here is it doesn't need Holdover, doesn't need Permafrost, but it would love them. But it doesn't need those to really shine. Um, but yep, yeah, and, and talking about Permafrost also, you could, you could do that to really guarantee a setup for those high value X cost um, plays. Especially if you're not doing an Ember Drain build, in that case, you know, you'll get around, you can get up to 8 to 11 Ember, depending on what your setup is. And uh, also, um, for just some of those high cost units like Shadow Siege, this could be a way to play them as well. You know, just a Permafrosted Perils get you there. Uh, but that's Perils, it's, it's pretty good. And then Razor Sharp Edge, this one I think embodies the concept of bread and butter. Um, now, the one caveat I will say here, uh, this middle point here is pretty important. It's pretty high value for a minus one Ember upgrade if you get it. You can do minus two as well, remember? That'll just make it cost zero on both plays, but minus one is good enough. It's, you know, at that point you're still just spending one Ember overall to get 20 flat persistent damage on a unit. That's pretty solid, not gonna lie. That's a... Ritual of Battles worth of damage that does not decay. 
think of it that way. Um, but uh, it's not so great at one cost. Like, I'll still lock it in at a one cost, because usually if that's happening, it's pretty early on, maybe the second or third rings, I would say, that you found that. Um, and you can still live with it. You probably aren't playing the two-costed version that comes out of it, um, so it kind of sucks that that shuffles back in, but luckily rings two and three are so short in length that that doesn't become a huge issue. It's much more of an issue if you just never upgrade it uh, and late game comes around. Hopefully by that time, though, you're able to snag a minus one ember upgrade or a minus two upgrade on it and make it much more smooth to play. But I will say at a one cost, not quite worth it. Uh, three embers, a bit much to pay for that. Though, you know, technically speaking, it's still the same cost as a vanilla ritual and technically doing more. But, you know, you want to get the good value out of it. So definitely I reduce it. Um, and it's also probably worth uh, thinking about adding HP to your squishy backliner that you're probably putting this on. Um, especially like, you know, Animus of Will. Animus of Will loves just to get some 25 HP upgrade or a large stone. Um, that's not out of the question at all because this combos such not, so nicely with that unit. Or like a Shattered Shell doesn't have very good health. Normally you might think about putting some health on it. Um, or uh, if you have the luxury, um, like a some sort of a flat health buffing card, that also works as well. But you got to make sure that that's happening consistent enough that you can get the value out of this. Anyway, that's Razor Sharp Edge, though. I think you'll. It's. Uh, I felt it felt wrong not to include this, even though it's not necessarily like a sexy one. I think it's just one of the most solid ones you can do. Um, it's such an actual like if you get it down to zero. Spell chain it, it's just super powerful. That can usually be the only scaling you need in a run. Um, and then offering token, I spoiled this one back when we were talking about the other stuff, but uh, it's just super good. Uh, oddly enough, like I find myself almost always spell chaining this if I have any semblance of an incant deck going. So. Uh, a few things to note is it's now draw positive, essentially. Even though you're discarding some, usually those discards you can be pretty strategic with. You can either just discard a dead weight, a scourge, a uh, blight, or in the ideal scenario, an offering card. Or just a, you know some spell that you're not planning on playing. But it's draw positive in the sense of digging through your deck and cycling through your deck. So instead of just, you know, you draw it, you draw it, and then you play it and draw one, that's what I call draw neutral, you know. It costed you a card to draw it, but you drew another one, so you didn't. it didn't actually cost you a draw. But draw positive means not only did you, uh, you know, replenish that draw, you draw an additional card. So that's actually pretty nice. Um, there's not many cards in the game that are draw positive that are this low cost, um, and, and not really having any requisites. Um, but yeah, bonus points for holdover. If I spell chain it, I love to get it on holdover. Uh, you also, also got to think, you know, in, in, the, in the terms of incant, it's very easy to trigger incants. You need no target. It costs zero at the start. Um, so you're getting a free incant, essentially, and then an, and it creates another incant, even though, the, even though the created version costs one, Usually that's not an issue. Usually, um, if you're lucky, you have uh, comboing it with Crypt Builders, Titans, uh, Tooths, and even the even the Guardian token is not bad if you have these, right? Um, if anything, even if you don't care about the sap, just to get those free incants is usually worth it in an incant deck. And 99999 nine, 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 nine bonus points for incant decks. That's what that should read right there. Um, also, uh, you know, I kind of mentioned it there, but uh, it's it can be a nice soft counter to Scourges and Blights. If you're discarding two cards a turn, in the new world, I find myself setting up top way more than I even was before. And I set up a lot top a lot before, but it's all very rare for me to set up bottom. And even against, like, Scourge Fell or Scourge Arcus or just general Scourge Troops, uh, Diligent, I find it hard to set up bottom. Um... So if, uh, unless you can you either silence them or have other ways to deal with them, you're probably getting the Scourges shuffled into your decks. 
the nice thing about offering token is it essentially takes care of those without you needing to really play them if you don't have the ember to do so and it also kind of counteracts the the uh, uh, the draw penalty that those scourges gave you and uh, yeah they'll still be in your deck but if as long as you have these offering tokens on holdover it doesn't really matter too much because you can keep choosing which cards to discard usually it's this you can find those scourges and just discard them play out your other stuff as if it was normally just your normal hand right so that's offering token it's a pretty good one definitely worth it in incant decks and then imp in a box um just grants you a wide variety of imps from a single play um you know for one ember which honestly i find has a high chance to replenish the ember anyway because pirate champer pirate champer is uh gonna be found a decent amount of times if you're playing two imp in a boxes um but even if it doesn't you know think of everything you can get you know fledgling imp can give you that offensive scaling you might be looking for welder helper can give you the defensive scaling you might be looking for any of them are going to be able to jump block you might get ember you might get consume return and you might get the alt the uh, ultimate high roll which is transcendent never going to be too sad to see that even if you just played this the very first turn you can play the other imps out and get immediate value out of that transcendent or you could just let it cycle back through your deck you're not you're not too sad to cycle back through your deck to find a transcendent after you played more and more imps right and it can also just it, say you already have transcendent just in the deck uh, it can quickly fuel it you know because Sometimes you draw that transcendent early and there's just nothing much to do with it. But if you have f f uh, four imps coming out ready to fuel it with whatever, you know, give it ember, give it armor, give it rage. Now it's, if, th if that transcendent is endless, you're already getting a kickstart on that. It's basically just gasoline to your transcendent. And even if you don't have an uh, imp build, it's still useful, I would say. I don't think it's ever not useful to have imp in a box spell chained. It's even even in the i'd say the worst case is you don't have an imp deck and you just have like a hidden passage overstacking deck even then if i had an imp in a box I'm, i might not take an imp in a box in that case but if i had one for whatever reason i would still spell chain it if there was no hugely better targets right i wouldn't just skip spell chain in that case i'd still spell chain it you can still deal some aoe damage you can still gain ember those are, you can still return a consumable. There's a lot of good stuff you can do. Um, uh, yeah, it's just a really high value play that doesn't really require much in place to make it high value. And in Snare, this is a really good one. Uh, similar to offering, t offering Token, it now has gone from draw neutral to draw positive when you spell chain it. And... Um, it's just incredibly flexible with what you can do. You know, you can you can root two enemies on the same floor. Like if there's two like pesky, maybe there's a backliner that's doing thirty damage and you're not killing it, and you don't want to just die die and or just lose a ton of health to your pyre. You can root that one. And you can also root another one if there's another one. Sometimes that's the case. Uh, or you could just root that one and then root maybe a tank on another floor to try to uh, make sure that when the next wave comes in there's no tanks actually and it's just all squishy so you can finish them all off the next turn you could double root a unit that you just have no hope of killing in the foreseeable future you know some of those big sharded up tanks uh, or actually the best case um, scenario there is those mini bosses in the divinity fight a lot of builds just can't deal with them um, even you know they can deal with everything in the game they can deal with the aoe tanks they can deal with relentless fights but they just can't do enough damage to kill these mini bosses well this alone should should basically counter it you know you can double root it and uh you know bonus points if you did have holdover and, and uh and uh what do you ever call it permafrost because then you'll basically have it guaranteed for then but not even needed necessarily as long as you're cycling through your deck in a good way you can always root them before they even make it to the top you know double root them then hopefully you'll cycle back into it in time double root them again as long as your deck is thin enough and you're drawing enough you should be able to basically permanently root them 
and either kill them eventually, or even if you don't kill them, just survive until the, the Relentless Rounds of Divinity and, and finish the game. Uh, just very flexible card. I'd, all, I'd argue almost hard counters those mini bosses. And as I said, Holdover and Permafrost, pretty good target. And at worst, you know, the worst case scenario is you didn't need to root anything. Even then, as long as there's any enemy target at all, you can just root them. Usually you, you could root a flying boss, that will be fine because it doesn't do anything. Uh, or just root an enemy that's dying. And in that case, it's basically an invigorating solution that didn't that drew one less than an invigorating solution. You're still going to draw two the next turn. You're still going to have a big hand the next turn. You still didn't spend much to do it. It's still an actually pretty good play. Not to mention, unlike Invigorating Solution, it's not consumable, so you'll you'll draw back into it eventually. So, Ensnare, pretty good one. And then, last but certainly not least, we have Crushing Demise. Um, I mean, this card just got more valuable in general, I'd argue, in the, the DLC, because these tanks are just ridiculous, and not only the tanks, but the mini-bosses. Like, being able to just delete those um is pretty valuable and if you want to but some of those times you know you may not be able to clear them out in such a way that you have just the enemy you're interested in on the floor and you have to hit like a 50 50 or maybe even worse you have to hit like a one out of three well if you got two shots at it you're gonna be either you know in the 50 50 case you're guaranteed just to kill them both and the one out of three you now you went from having to hit on a one out of three to now you just have to not hit the one out of three right <laughs> you know you went from one out of three to a two out of three chance to get what you want uh either of those cases is certainly a good uh situation to be in and even if you low roll you still killed the other stuff at least um and uh, obviously just like most one costs you do want to get a minus one ember but also, permafrost isn't horrible either. Um, you could you could leave it at one and permafrost it if you need to. That just guarantees it's going to be around for when you need it. You just probably have to dedicate most of your ember to the crushing demise that turn, but that might not be a bad thing. That might be uh, benef more beneficial in some decks than just sort of relying on cycling back through it. Uh, also, quite useful for killing your own floor. You know, you can kill two of your own units now. Um, if you have one of those builds that is like. Uh, you know, playing a molded or a primitive mold or wicked blaze quite often, wanting to do it basically every turn for the scaling. Uh, this is about as good as a card as you can spell chain for that. You know, kill both your units on any given turn. Uh, I mean, you got to think there's a reason Hallowed Halls is so good, and you're essentially Hallowed Hallsing at that point, right? And then. What would a, a list be without a, a crap ton of honor roll mentions, right? And I, there's probably more I could fit on here, but this is this is what I came up with. Um, I, I, th I threw two colorless cards in here. There's more that you could do, but I felt like these were generally the highest value ones I have been finding, like Petrified Skull, similar to um, Crushing Demise. It just turns out to be pretty valuable to delete two units out of one card, right? And with Petrified Skull, since you're able to target it, you could even just let it cycle back through your deck, like in the in the in the in the mini boss scenario. Just kill the mini boss, the first one, and then hold the purge or the you know the purge created version, let it cycle back through, and then kill the other mini boss. Pretty good value there. I should also give a caveat that I've heard rumors, inklings, whispers in the wind that maybe Crushing Demise and Petrified Skull might not be able to kill those mini bosses in the future depending on where the devs want to go with that i they're they're rethinking that apparently so if that happens obviously this guide is outdated but i think still that those are pretty top notch even if they can't kill mini bosses they can kill 210 health tanks that are really annoying so i think they're still going to make this list either way old magic this one's kind of obviously dependent on what type of old magic you get, but, you know, it basically satisfies a lot of the previous cards that we listed, like Space Prism, for example. If you have a version that increases capacity, you can get it to increase two capacity. Uh, if you have a plus 10 damage, Razor Sharp Edge, you know, you basically can get the 20 damage out of it, plus whatever else you're doing. Um, 
and so on and so forth. Like it's it's generally going to be a good spell chain target. Uh, obviously, get it down to zero though. Important work. Uh, I I didn't give this one its own uh, slide just because I didn't think it was fitting the sort of um, non synergy requirement enough, but it is worth noting important work in the right deck is insane with spell chain. You can set up infinites with it. You can even if even outside of the infinite, like say you have a transcend imp or even just like a fledgling imp infused with a fledgling imp. Um, you can just play it twice or you play it once, you play the important work, then you play it again because it's endless, it draws it, and then you have a spell chain version, you play it again. That's thirty rage right there. And let's not even get into how much rage a transcendent would get you in that case. I mean, GG if it's transcendent. GG if it's transcendent in general. Um, but, you know, even in those cases of like a fledgling imp, 30 rage to your entire floor, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, March of Shield's a low key one that I think has been slept on. Um, not always going to be there. I, I think. I think this doesn't make the list just because it's not always needed. It's only really needed if you have a lot of shuffling that you want to do, but. It is worth noting that sometimes a single March of Shields isn't really getting what you want done um, with some setups, especially now that Railbeater gives melee weakness. A lot of times you might not want Railbeater in the very front, but you might want him in front of your damage dealer. And this is especially true in a lot of these cases where you're overstacking floors. I find you usually want like a dedicated tank that might not be Railbeater. Railbeater can be a tank, but a lot of times I'd rather have a more beefy unit as a tank. So you march uh, Railbeater forward first, then this purged march shield comes up, and then you march your actual tank forward. So now Railbeater is behind your tank, and your DPS unit is right behind the Railbeater, or your high damage unit is right behind the Railbeater, and actually taking making use of that melee weakness. Uh, but yeah, it's not always going to be useful, obviously. It's it, it's like, when you want to shuffle, it's pretty useful. And, and I should mention, though, also, it's like, you know, get it down to zero, and it's 20 armor for one ember at that point. That's also not bad. That's on the level of a one-cost branding right, uh, you know, essentially. Maybe even better, since you don't really have to have health initially to do it. Um, Steel Enhancer. This one almost made the list, to be honest. I uh, just... I found I was, when I was taking it, like, like it felt wrong to put Razor Sharp on the list and this on the list, because I would almost never do Steel Enhancer if I already had Razor Sharp Hedge in hand. But it is worth noting, Steel Enhancer is a pretty good one, you know, it doesn't need any Ember upgrade even, because it starts at zero, and it just becomes a plus six, plus six for one. And that's pretty decent. Uh, the only thing I would say is, like, the health is largely irrelevant in a lot of cases, I think. So really, you're just looking at the damage. But even a you know, usually you're, if you're doing that play, you didn't hit on Razor Sharp Edge, and this is your way to actually give your ch uh, deck a chance to scale. And and we, I should have actually put Root Seeds right next to it because it's the same story with Root Seeds, uh, but it's also a similar story with Engraft and Root Seeds in that Root Seeds now becomes draw positive. But Root Seeds, you're kind of doing it if you're desperate for scaling, I would say, or just it's it's an okay spell chain. I think it, it it's like even if you if you don't have a good spell chain target, I think root seeds is always worth it if you plan on getting it down to a zero cost. Um, like if you plan if you either have it already at zero, uh, sorry, if it's already at zero. If a merchant of magic is on the same ring or the very next ring, I think it's worth a spell chain if you have no better targets. You know, if I go, I'm not gonna go all the way back to the slide, but you remember one of those previous slides? I said don't just do it just to do it. I think Root Seeds uh, qualifies above that. Like, it, it's worth doing it. Um, it'll give you extra draw for the next turn. You know, you'll fill up uh, two extra cards. You get four damage. Four damage isn't great, but it's not it's not nothing, right? It's a sharpen worth of damage. And then in Graft, it's just a little too situational. You know, it really just shines an explosive sentient, and it's decent in Cultivate. Uh, otherwise, it's it can be kind of meh. I don't know if I would spell chain it outside of those two s scenarios, but it's certainly very top tier with the explosive sentient. 
you know, you're getting two explosive triggers that turn. If you got it down to a zero cost, it's not even costing you Ember, and you're drawing two extra the next turn. Um, yeah, it, you can even, yeah, I mean, you still, like, gain Ember, even. Uh, and then Hoarfrost, this one, it's pretty situational, but it's worth noting the, the ceiling there is quite attainable. Uh, the only problem there is it's three costs, so you really do need that minus two, which makes it not really fit the criteria for those previous uh, cards I've called out. Uh, it's not really going to work at minus one unless you have artifact support. But if you can get a minus two on it and a spell chain, then for three ember, you're doubling frostbite once, then twice the same turn. That is flying kill central. That um, you could even kill divinity with that. Uh, you know, a few turns of that, as long as you have a proper frostbite build going. You know, obviously divinity purifies himself but that almost doesn't matter you can you can do about a thousand a turn pretty easily with this spell chained and depending on the shards that should only be about four turns worth then so and, and honestly you can get more if you have the proper setup you can get to you can you can one shot divinity with a really good like if you hell vented this with the spell chain on it and the minus two probably looking at a uh, just a one shot on divinity um Ember Cash is also an interesting one. You, I still think you could want to minus one it, but that's six excavated embers that get shuffled into your pile. So, you know, it's still slow in the sense that you, your first draw through it doesn't really do anything for you, but the next draw through, oh, you have one powerful deck. You got six excavated embers. You got to think there's a cavern event where it shuffles three blights into your deck that you have to survive two rings through just to get three excavated embers but here you're getting six of them so the price you know the price you pay on that cavern versus here you just have to simply play a card uh yeah it's pretty powerful you will cycle through your deck and have a ton of en energy on that second go through not to mention set up pseudo infinites you could i mean you could you could also set up an infinite with this and then Wicklash, it's very similar to um, Razor Sharp Edge. You know, it's basically the same in the terms of what it's going to do for you. Except this one's a little more situational since it's a Burnout card. Uh, if you don't have Burnout support beyond this, it might not be that good. Uh, if you're not using, like, you know, the Burnout type units um, or otherwise have, like, additional Burnout extension or a good amount of reform. It's probably not going to be a good spell chain target. Uh, but if you do, it's right there with Razor Sharp Edge. And also, both these reform cards, Primitive Mold or Molded, uh, you know, they're, they're, they got the edge on Wicked Blaze here for spell chains, in my opinion, just because they have a less cost and it's a lot easier to get them down. But you could do it with Wicked Blaze as well if you want a minus to it. But it's just nice to be able to get uh, extra reform that turn. Um, especially if it's a deck that makes sense. But even beyond that, even if you're not looking to do two reforms in one turn, a lot of decks, particularly a little fade, it's uh, useful to just sh have that purged version there for the recycle. Usually on the that's coming close to like the relentless rounds and whatnot. Uh, particularly, obviously, Firelight and uh, a little Icarus will want that because their whole kind of early game depends on drawing those reforms at the right time. Uh, additionally, if you had to get yourself in a situation where your reform pool got kind of mucked up, being able to play two out of one card is certainly nice because then you can get around, uh, you know, rolling the wrong unit on your reform. That's speci that's more specific to Primitive Mold, obviously, because Molded, you get a target who you want. And then here I have Echo uh, Transfer and Infusion, I believe the other one's called. I kind of have it, I have it buried here, but that's basically the other one's the one that gives you the health, 10 health for Extract 1. These ones are kind of dependent on two things. Um, either that the card themselves is infused, or that you, if they're not infused, that you have enough echo generation that they're actually playable if either of those are present boom you got really good at spell chain targets here especially echo transfer i'd say that's 30 flat damage for one ember cost and of course uh you know four echoes if it's uninfused and 
two echoes if it is infused. But that's that's pretty good if you can if you can pay that echo price, it's worth it. And then the echo, the infusion costs less echoes, um, but I say kind of gives less benefit. But still, twenty health is pretty nice for the price of one ever. Compare that to cycle of life and tell me which one's better, right? And then return to soul. This one almost I think could make the earlier lists. Um, I guess I just don't find myself doing it as much as those other cards, but for the record, it's a very good spell chain, almost without any synergies required. I'd say the only real requirement is that you gotta, I guess, not have a super thin deck that doesn't have much good targets. Um, that can happen from time to time, but usually you're gonna have a lot of, you know, plinks, just stuff that you wanna like burn out of your deck. Um, and spell chaining this is amazing at that, and bonus points if you can hold it over. You can really thin a deck out to be, and you don't. There, there becomes a certain point where you don't have to play it anymore, right? You can just stop playing it once you got your deck down to six cards or something, right? Uh, if you can consume two of them a turn, that's a pretty good deal. You gotta also remember that those are coming back infused. They're coming back cheap. Like this is not a very heavy lift. Um, and then the last one on here is accelerated. Uh, incubation, not much to say there. You either have eggs or you don't. If you have it, pretty good. If you don't, probably not needed. But with eggs, particularly the, I would say the the spell chain here is less needed if your only eggs are the bog fly eggs, because those only have five shell. But particularly the other two, you know, the kin the kin host pupae has got like eight shell. The the bog host cocoon has twelve shell. Spell chaining this is just quite nice. Um, you're gonna get six shell out of one card for one ember. If you don't need to upgrade it at all, just slap the spell chain on it. Intrinsic for the win too. Although intrinsic could, depending on how many banner, if if you have like not a guarantee that you draw your correct eggs, that could be a mistake. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's gonna do it for this guide. Um, hopefully that was useful. If you think there's any that I'm sleeping on that I should have mentioned here, feel free to let me know in the comments. I'm not infallible. I'm sure I'm missing some pretty awesome ones, so let me know. And uh, yeah, until next time, peace.